She is often considered one of the most important women in history, who changed the field of science and medicine for the better. Marie Curie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and the first person to win it twice. And during the First World War, she developed mobile radiography units to provide X-ray services inside of field hospitals. But all of this work would lead to her untimely death at the age of 66. Marie Curie died in 1934 from what was a plastic anemia, which many have considered to have been caused by the radiation relating to her scientific research and also with her work in X-rays. She's buried inside of France's National Mausoleum today. However, when her coffin and original grave was opened, there was a huge problem, as her body was so highly radioactive that special measures had to be taken for her new grave. So what was found when Marie Curie's coffin and grave was opened? Marie Curie was born in 1867 in Warsaw, then part of the Russian Empire. From an early age, she showed exceptional intelligence and determination, and after moving to Paris to study at the Sorbonne, she immersed herself in physics and mathematics, eventually marrying fellow scientist Pierre Curie. Together, they began investigating strange rays emitted by uranium, a phenomenon Marie would later nickname radioactivity. The Curie Laboratory was a place of intense work and limited resources. Marie often handled radioactive substances directly, stirring glowing solutions with no protective equipment. Radium salts were kept in drawers and test tubes were carried in pockets. And exposure was constant. At the time, radiation was seen as a mysterious thing and even beneficial, and there were no safety standards. And no one truly understood the long-term effects of prolonged exposure. After Pierre Curie's sudden death in 1906, Marie continued her work along while raising two daughters. She became the first woman to teach at the Sorbonne and later established mobile X-ray units during the First World War, personally operating them near the front lines to help surgeons locate bullets and shrapnel in the wounded soldiers. This humanitarian work saved countless lives but further increased her exposure to radiation. Over the years, Marie Curie's health began to decline. She suffered from chronic fatigue, weakness and reoccurring illnesses. Her eyesight deteriorated and she experienced persistent pain. These symptoms were not immediately linked to radiation exposure, as the scientific understanding of its dangers was still developing. And by the 1920s and early 1930s, however, it became clear that her body had been irreversibly damaged. In 1934, Marie Curie's condition worsened dramatically. She was diagnosed with aplastic anemia, a serious and often fatal disease in which the bone marrow fails to produce enough blood cells. Today, this illness is known to be strongly associated with prolonged exposure to ionising radiation. At the time, doctors could do little to treat it, and Marie Curie spent her final months in the saint scamoz sanatorium in the French Alps, a quiet mountain retreat intended to help patients recover in clean air and rest. Despite the peaceful settings, her condition steadily declined. She became increasingly weak and required constant care, and on the 4th of July 1934, at the age of 66, Marie Curie died. Her death was not sudden or dramatic, but slow and exhausting the result of decades of unprotected exposure to radioactive materials. It was a cruel end for someone who had devoted her life to scientific progress and human welfare. Even after her death, the dangers surrounding her work remained evident. Her notebooks, laboratory equipment and personal belongings were found to be dangerously radioactive, and still remain so today. Many are still stored in lead-lined boxes, accessible only under strict safety conditions. This danger even extended to her grave and burial. To begin with, she was buried alongside her husband's remains inside of a modest grave in a cemetery in Skio. There was a speculation at the time of her burial that she would be cremated, but instead she was interred. It was said of this first burial that there was a brief ceremony without civil or religious ritual, 
Her frail, wasted body, which she had devoted to science, was lowered in a plain oak coffin in the same grave with her husband in a crowded and inexpensive part of the little village cemetery. Roses were distributed to each of the 25 laboratory associates and 150 friends and scientists who were there when an automobile hearse brought the coffin at 11.30am. The coffin had a small, plain silver plate bearing her name and the dates of her birth and death. Wreaths of roses were placed on the top of the coffin and it was just 10 minutes from the time the coffin arrived until all had gone. However, because of her work, there were calls decades later to dig up the remains of Mary's body and to place her inside the National Mausoleum in France, known as the Pantheon. But there were discussions about the process of exhuming and digging her up, as there were worries about the radiation levels of her body and her grave. This made things more complicated, but eventually the exhumation was planned to take place. It was said about this that outside the cemetery dose rates of radiation varied. After unsealing the tomb by tipping the tombstone upwards slightly, a radiation level measurement and air sample were made inside of the vault. The radon level allowed workers to proceed to the next stage without having to wear respiratory protection. After fully opening the vault, the stone slabs covering Marie Curie's wooden coffin were removed. The wood showed signs of decay, but a metal plate identified the coffin's content. Upon opening the wooden coffin, workers found inside an intact lead coffin. Now she had been buried within the thick lead coffin because of the dangers of radiation from her remains and body. But what was found next inside of Marie Curie's coffin was shocking. It was said that four workers lifted the lead coffin and placed it on a vinyl sheet. Inspection revealed the lead thickness to be about two and a half millimetres. The only damage was four small holes that were made to hook anchors for the lift. Inspection through the holes revealed a white wooden coffin inside. Funeral workers arrived to bring the coffins in which the Curies were to be taken to the Pantheon. And upon inspection, workers found that Marie Curie's lead coffin would not fit in the Pantheon coffin, so it would be necessary to open the lead coffin and transfer her remains to the Pantheon coffin. While they watched, funeral officials speculated that given the lead coffin was sealed, opening it might yield surprises despite the 61-year interval after burial. At 9am, the lead coffin was opened and inside was neither a skeleton nor dust. Marie Curie's body was well preserved. Her face was recognisable. Examination of her hands said to bear scars from exposure to radiation revealed no marks. Stems and petals of roses that had been placed upon her body were still there, blackened but visible. At 9.15am her body was gently transferred to the Pantheon coffin. It was then closed with all present, having paid their respects, not without emotion. So, in 1934, when Marie Curie was buried, there was a concern about the contamination of radiation to her body due to the fact she was buried inside of a lead-lined coffin, but in 1995, when her remains were transferred to the Pantheon, there were visible concerns about the radiation levels and her body. What was found was that her husband's remains, who had been buried in the same vault as her, were much radioactive and were very much contaminated. Still today, over a century after her work, many of Marie Curie's possessions, including her laboratory equipment and notebooks, are contaminated with radiation. She is still today buried inside of the vault in the Pantheon, and she is considered one of the greatest scientists in history. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.